My name is Flavia Agnes. I'm a women's rights lawyer. I'm the founder director of an NGO based in Mumbai called Majlis. Now I'm speaking about the sexual abuse case, particularly in the context of the Nirbhaya case and the new laws that came after the Nirbhaya case and what is the ground reality today and how it has helped or not helped victims. We all know that this gruesome case happened in Delhi in 2012, in December, where this girl Jyoti Pandey was very brutally violated and subsequently she died. And there was a national uproar and there was a demand for a new law. New law that will be more stringent. Basically the demand was to have death penalty for rape. That anybody who rapes a woman should be given death penalty. We got a new law in April. but. This is not the first time we got this type of law. We already had it for child sexual abuse in November 2012, a month before the Nirbhaya incident happened. This is called Protection of Children from Sexual Offenses Act. It's called the POXO Act. Now this act broadened the definition of penetrative sexual abuse. This means it redefined the rape law and broadened it to include acts which are not penovaginal penetrative because in Nirbhaya case as well as we had there were so many cases where there was different type of insertion of objects, finger penetration, oral sex, all of that was not considered rape. But after the POXO Act came, they all became part of the penetrative sexual abuse and the same definition we also have on, in 376 after the new law came which is called the Nirva law because it came after the protest after the Nirva case. Now so many years have gone by, 2013 this law came, now we are in 2018. So it is important to understand how this law has helped victims or not helped victims and what are the cases that are coming out in the public domain. Not much studies there. Ours is one of the unique studies that have brought out certain facts which I would like to share. Now, if you see the Nirbhaya case, if you see the public protest, these are mainly of a particular category. Middle class women getting raped by lower class boys and it happens on the lonely street. It happens when the girls go out. So there is a class issue here. There's not only a gender issue here, there's a class issue here. And it is a brutal rape, brutal injuries. But when we actually see the cases, they don't fit this category. Because a large number of cases of rape are by known persons. They are not stranger rapes. Stranger rapes are very, very few compared to known persons rapes. Like in Maharashtra, it is said, it was said in the legislature by the law minister himself, that 95% of the cases of rape that get reported are known person rapes and not stranger rapes. So which means the framework of Nirbhaya case of a brutal rape by strangers fits in only a very small percentage of cases that get reported. So what are the cases that actually get reported? So these cases come in various categories and surprisingly the location where the rape happens is not the street. The location is the home, either the home of the accused or home of the victim. So it means that rape is happening in the home, yet our demand remains that we need better street lighting, we need CCTV cameras, we need certain mobile apps, we need to carry chili powder in our purse, we need to learn karate to protect ourselves from the rape. Now this definition actually is for a rape of a particular type, but does not fit into other rape cases about which we don't even talk about. In our study, what came out is the rape that happens in the home by members of the family are much more than the stranger rapes. But this category we never talk about. We sweep, sweep it under the carpet because we think there'll be badnam in the family. 
we think that the entire family will be stigmatized. So we try to hide these cases. But if you see the children rape, most of these rapes are at home and by members of the family. So this is one of the first myths that gets broken when we look at our data. So when a case happens at home, what happens to the girl? What kind of support she gets? Most of the time these cases are suppressed. The girl, either she herself does not understand what is happening to her, even the mother is not aware of it. But even when the mother is aware of it, mother doesn't want to report. Nobody wants to report. But sometimes the case gets out of hand. And that is the only time it comes out. And by then, this child would have been abused for over a year or two years. So another myth that gets broken is that injuries are there. Violent, brutal rape where uh, the act has happened and the child or the woman is brutalized and immediately she rushes to the hospital and in the hospital uh, she tells the incident and the case is recorded. But in a family rape case, the incident is recorded after about a year, six months after the incident. Very rarely the case comes out the first incident. And when such cases are reported, the doctors do not see what they expect to see or the police do not see what they expect to see is a girl who has been brutalized and traumatized and she's got bleeding injuries and she's come with those injuries to the police station to report. So when this girl goes and says my father has been abusing me for about a year and then they take her to the hospital and they, the doctor also does not find the injuries at all. What you have in record is only what the girl says, it is the girl's testimony. Now when a girl reports a case like this and goes back and the father is arrested, there is a lot of pressure on the girl to retract. Because she has to wait now for a year till the whole investigations are over and the, till, till the case comes up for trial. Now there is a pressure from the father's family, there is a pressure from the mother, there is an economic consequence of such rapes uh, of the father in prison. He is not getting bail. He, uh, by the time the case comes up, the entire family is frustrated. And the entire family is angry with this girl for having reported. So when the girl comes to court, in evidence, this girl says either this thing has not happened or she falsely reported because she was angry with the father. Or if the mother is support, supporting the girl, she will say, my mother forced me to say this. Or the mother herself will say, this girl just ran away and filed this false complaint. Now when this comes up in evidence, what, what the other side argues is that this girl ha is telling lies, it is a false case. And then the story is made up, is that the father was uh, trying to correct this girl. She has a boyfriend, she goes out with the boyfriend and when we try to stop her in anger, she has gone and filed this case. So what the judgment comes out is this girl is a liar. She has not told the truth, she has come and, she, uh, and falsely reported that the father has raped her. So these are the judgments we actually get. Where you get an evidence the girls are telling lies and they are implicating their own fathers because they want to have an affair with another boy. So the girl takes on the stigma upon herself. And we know them, we, the, we know these cases. We see the entire process, how these cases progressed from the time of the FIR. We are talking to the girl all the time. We are taking her to the court. And without support, this girl can never say the truth because of the pressure. Only if there is support and we say, yes, this has happened and she's deposing and another thing that happens is the minimum seven years punishment is there for aggravated rape there is 10 years punishment now even if the girl is telling the truth she does not want her father to be put up in prison for seven years or 10 years so this is another very serious dilemma this girl faces and when this happens she may tell the truth to the court and but she'll say i do not want my father to be punished or I do not want my father to be punished for 10 years or 7 years, she tells the judge. But the judge does not have the leeway 
to convict the father and give less punishment because now it has become mandatory after the recent amendment it has become mandatory for the judge to give that seven years punishment then if it is conviction the judge has no choice to give less punishment so what the judge does is say there's not enough evidence and acquits, acquits the father and the father goes back to the same house and the girl continues to live there and then of course the girl is married off to a boy in the village and the entire thing goes out of purview of everybody and these contribute to the national statistics and in this stat, such type of cases we get figures figures of acquittals we get figures of conviction so this is one type of case that is least spoken about sometimes in a week we get about three four such cases sometimes we get cases where the father has abused two sisters and both have become pregnant now when she becomes pregnant there's a clinching evidence because there is dna testing even if abortion is carried out but in most cases abortion cannot be carried out because the girl is past the stage the five months uh, pregnancy under which you can have an abortion so she has to carry the child full term now this is a very grave situation much more serious than the nirbhaya case that happened in the public domain because this doesn't happen in the public domain and there are, there is already domestic violence on the mother father is earning member father is a sole earning member the entire family livelihood depends upon father's earning there's education of the children to be taken care of there are other social issues that are involved here so you can imagine the trauma that goes on and the pressure on the girl to retract and to tell a story that is more convincing to the court which is the court is ready to accept and unless we pay attention to this serious case we are not going to move further and we are not going to arrest sexual abuse this is one of our serious concerns in the pro- in our, the project that we do has come out and we do not know how to resolve this and where to resolve it and how to get the how to get the law to respond to this need because law has a particular framework and your a case must fit into that framework only and if it is doesn't fit that framework then this case has not happened so this is one level at which rapes takes place another entry point for the rape cases you suddenly you find a 12 year old girl 13 year old girl 14 year old girl pregnant we just having a case right now where a 13 year old girl is pregnant she is about 3 months pregnant and she is brought to the hospital for abortion now under poxo that new act that came any sexual activity of children under 18 is a punishable offense if the boy is over 18 he will be convicted under poxo now we have these cases where the girls are pregnant they are very young 12 13 14 15 they sometimes they do not know how they have become pregnant but the the pregnancy is the only evidence that this small child has been sexually abused and the fa- family says they do not know nobody knows this girl is anyway neglected at home that she is and she is brought home like when she is 5 months pregnant 6 months pregnant because she either has a pain in the stomach or because she has missed her periods for so many months or for some other reason like she has fever or she has fallen and she has an injury for some other totally different reason now when she comes to the hospital and the checking is done in a public hospital it is found that the girl is pregnant now when the girl is found pregnant it is mandatory for the police to record the case it is mandatory for the doctor to report this case the doctor has no choice to say i will not record this case case because the girl doesn't want to report the choice is not there in law today since it is mandatory and the doctor reports and the police must record this case for both it is mandatory so the police comes and records the case but to record a case there has to be an accused person she is the victim but who is accused so in the hospital at this stage when she finds herself pregnant and she is so traumatized by this knowledge that she is pregnant and then she is asked who did this to you now here what happens is something else very strange happens 
the child has to give a name. She's bombarded and she says, say the name, say the name. Who is this person? Who is this person? And she cannot say, I do not know. So she, she, she says a name. She says the name of mama. She says, says the name of neighbor, some other man. She says one name. Unfortunately, in most of the cases, whom the girl has said as the accused person, the DNA has not matched. Again, the girl becomes a liar. So the question is why the DNA does not match? Because earlier we used to think the accused person must be bribing the, the forensic lab, bribing somebody else, getting a false report. But then both are coming from the marginalized communities, poor communities, and it cannot always be the bribing thing. So then we wonder, we wonder, we keep thinking, my God, why is the DNA not matching? Because what happens in this case, first of all, she's beyond the stage of abortion, she's admitted in the hospital, case is recorded, now the family doesn't want to take her back. Because if she takes, they take her back, there's badnam in the family, badnam in the whole community. So she has to be put away. So she's sent to a, a rescue home, shelter home, where, which will provide her a long-term support till she delivers. So she's sent there and she's pregnant. After that, she has to deliver, deliver the child. So imagine a 14-year-old girl or a 13-year-old girl or 12-year-old girl has to go through the whole anxiety, the pain of delivering the child, feeding the child for the next 15, 20 days, and then giving up the child in adoption. Only after that, her family will visit her. And then after that, she will be sent home. So now, and she stays there, and she sees the girl who will come to court to give evidence. When she comes to evidence and the medical report is produced, the name she has said, that man is arrested, the DNA process of the mother, of the baby that was born, and of the accused are all matched together. And they find that this was not the person. And that is the traumatic moment for us because the acquittal will happen because of this, because there is no medical evidence at all for this person, never mind what the girl is deposing in the court. So the question is, why doesn't the DNA match? Why the 12-year-old, 13-year-old, 14-year-old, 15-year-old is not able to give the correct name of the abuser? We do, really do not know the reason, but it could be because she wants to shield the abuser, and so she's given another false name. It could be that. But then we probe deeper and deeper, and then we realize that is not the case also. So what could be the case? And now we have come to the conclusion is that these 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year old girls go through a lot of abuse in the family. That means she goes through a lot of abuse in the neighborhood. There might be many men who are abusing her, sexually assaulting her. And, but then particular abuse must have been traumatic. So she remembers certain names. Other names either she does not remember or she does not want to report about them because it was not so painful or she has a rapport with that person. Something else is happening. But the painful fact is that we are denying that 12, 13, 14, 15 year olds are going through a series of abuse when they are very young and they have no protection at all. The only protection is if she becomes pregnant. If she becomes pregnant, by virtue of being pregnant, the abuse cannot be hidden any longer. It has to be brought to a public hospital notice. It has to be brought to the notice of the police. It has to be brought to the notice of the shelter home. There's a long institutional agencies that come into play. And then she's put away in this home. But we are not taking care of our children to ensure that sexual abuse does not happen in the family or in a neighborhood or some other man taking this girl away, abusing her. But we have cases which are like younger than 10 years where a neighborhood boy takes the girl on the pretext of giving some chocolate. He takes her to the lonely place and he abuses her and then the girl suffers serious injuries. She comes home and she reports the case. Those cases are reported 
and then the family stands very firmly by the girl and reports about this man and only in these cases we are able to get conviction. So what happens to these older girls between the age of 10 to 15 or 10 to 18 who are abused and who don't know what to do about it and in the judgment these girls are also recorded as liars, their cases are recorded as false cases and there is acquittal here. So now you go back to that girl. This is all judgments, we read the judgments, etc. We read reports in the newspapers. But now you see the girl. The girl is already coming from a marginalized community. She could be Hindu, she could be uh, Muslim, she could be scheduled caste, she could be of any community, but they are all marginalized communities. She's hardly had any education. She may be even school dropout. Now she is abused, she is put away. Then she has delivered a child. Then she goes back to the family. The family doesn't want to keep her even at that time. She's sent to the village and then she's married off. And, she, and she's told not to talk about this abuse to anybody. Imagine the trauma that this girl goes through and then the domestic violence that happens after the marriage. For this girl, it is a continuum of abuse which goes again unnoticed. It is totally invisibilized and nobody talks about it again. But having been abused, we're thinking that the legal process is going, coming there to help her. If the girl is in a particular social ladder, the incident, instead of empowering her, pushes her down the social ladder. The legal process pushes her down and without support, she has no way to stand. She's out of school, she cannot go back to school, she's totally vulnerable and she's married off in the state of extreme vulnerability. So you can imagine what happens to her after her marriage. And we have not been able to again provide support to such girls who are abused and impregnated and then going through this kind of violence, which is a continuum of violence. And we do not know any answers to this because our understanding of rape is so superficial and it's continued to be superficial that we have not gone deeper into the problem. What is the problem that we are actually facing we have not discussed. Now if we see among our own data, the cases of girls who were pregnant, when the cases were reported, you will be shocked to know that there was a 36% cases where of girls 15 to 18. So before 18, these girls are pregnant. But even more shocking is that 31% were pregnant between the age of 10 to 15. So whether it is stranger rape, whether it is consent rape, it really does not matter. Today, everything is an offense. So 31% of the cases that get reported are of girls who are sexually active from the age of 10 to 15. After that, we have a state of processes, the legal process, the court going to give evidence, everything is there to declare her as a liar. So now we have this entire setup, we have POXO, we have the Nirbhaya law, we have all these things, but they're not helping these girls who are actually abused. They, these are the categories that we are dealing with. And then of course there is another category where the girl and boy elope. Their boyfriend and girlfriend, they elope, she's under 18, He's over 18 and we call these elopement cases. Now here the sex happens with the consent of the girl. Usually the girl is 15, 16 years old, uh, 14, it can be as low as 14. Uh, this boy is a boyfriend and she wants to marry him. But the parents do not want to marry. Now what are these cases where the girl is supposing, supposedly Hindu and the boy is Muslim or the girl is higher caste and the boy is lower caste? and the family is vehemently against this girl's relationship with that boy and then they file a case of rape. Now in such cases also the girl says uh, he didn't rape, rape me, it was with my consent or then her, the, the boy's lawyer tells her he was not the boy, some other boy, there was mistaken identity or whatever. But the what, only thing that a girl wants to do is when I'm 18 and he comes out, I'm going to marry him. Marry him. And sometimes the parents want to break the relationship 
they want to send the girl to village again and marry her even while she is minor so they don't mind this minor marriage they they only mind that the girl has chosen a boy of another community of another caste or of another religion that's the only issue that bothers the parents so, and which according to me strengthens patriarchy it strengthens the father's power over the girl or the parents power over the girl and throttles her autonomy now these are like different categories of cases and unless we understand them in their complexity merely having a law which is stringent which says that uh, we can the punishment a life imprisonment for the entire re remainder of the life of the accused that is what we have got as deterrent unfortunately this law comes into place only in cases where the girl is of the middle class and the boys are of the lower class and then we have had cases where death penalty has been given so of course nirbhaya case was before the this law came but we had a case called shakti mills case now in the shakti mills case again like the delhi gang rape this is a mumbai case where two girls who were raped who were like one was 19 20 years another 22 years and there were uh, five boys were doing uh, committed rape out of that three were common to the both the cases so in the amended law there is a section called repeat offenders so this case was not fitting repeat offender category but the state made it in such a way so that death penalty could be given to these three boys now one of the boys is just 19 years old another one is 22 year old and the death penalty usually is to be 14 years then sometimes it is like longer period but it was for the remainder of the entire life so these boys are put away for their entire so and not entire life that was what the first case in the second case they were given death penalty so the three boys are given death penalty which is uh, which is upheld by the high court now and now it's gone to supreme court now this is the situation we have and this is the impact of the law but how that law can be deterrent for in ordinary cases how that law can be uh, a case of social transformation where we'll have a a better environment for our women if you see our uh, if you see the number of cases from 2015 to 2016 in the ncrb report in delhi there is a 33% increase in bombay there is about 13% increase so cases of rape are going on which are now getting more and more reported but doesn't mean that rape has stopped that doesn't mean that there will be conviction or the conviction rate has gone up only in extreme cases we will have this kind of punishment in other cases what we'll have is acquittals so acquittals are like 75% so 75% of the girls are declared as liars that they fi filed a false case and now there is a move to dilute this law because the girls are telling lies so the end results that we have today is that there is not really rape but this is all lies and uh, women are telling lies girls are telling lies and they're filing false cases and at the end of it there is no uh, conviction so let us dilute the law so this is the result that is happening after uh, three years four years of this new law so we need to understand the case in much more totality we need to understand the issue in much more totality we should understand rape in the structure of our society in the structure of the community and in the structure of the family only then we will be able to find an answer that is effective which can deal with this issue thank you very much